we go. Share slides and full screen. Okay, so uh, welcome back to class. And uh, uh, I'd like to finish up the discussions on the Bose-Einstein condensate and move on to fermions, hopefully today. So just recap what we have done. So we had this Lagrangian, and the, what, what, the way we derived this Lagrangian was from the principle of Galilean invariance, and then the, this potential, external potential had to be constant, this chemical potential, and this kind of interaction term was allowed. So I, we chose the sign for repulsive interaction. And, and this whole thing made sense when you actually did the last homework problem where you quantize it, build a multi-particle state, you look at the wave function, and that really does satisfy the same Schrodinger equation like non relativistic quantum mechanics you have studied in 137. So that's the way we sort of make sense of this Lagrangian. But now we are looking at this Lagrangian as a theory of classical field instead of quantum field. And as you have seen already, that actually had a very interesting consequence of describing this uh, very strange quantum state of matter called the Bose-Einstein condensate. And I haven't actually explained this, but apparently in the literature, this Bose-Einstein condensate is named the fifth state of matter. So as you all know from probably from high school days, that there are three states of matter, gas, liquid, and solid, right? And then the fourth state of matter is plasma, where each atom become ionized and the electrons and nuclei start to move independently from each other at a very high temperatures, like a, uh, inside the sun. So that's where the plasma is. And that's a very high temperature stuff. Now we're going to very low temperature stuff where the fifth state of matter is the Bose-Einstein condensate. So apparently that's the sort of a, uh, a little bit more catchy name on the Bose-Einstein condensate. But anyway, so once you have this Lagrangian, you can derive this Euler Lagrange equation and uh, we solve this Euler Lagrange equation as special cases. And one special simple case is that the psi field is just a constant and takes the value of square root of mu minus lambda. And this is a number density, as it turns out, with some phase. And once you have this solution, we made use of the fact that uh, there is a Galilean symmetry in this uh, Lagrangian. So we went to a different reference frame where the Bose-Einstein condensate is now flowing. This, this was the Bose-Einstein condensate at rest. Now after Galilean transformation, the Bose-Einstein condensate is now flowing. <clears throat> so this is also supposed to be a solution. And you are now checking that indeed, just by plugging this uh, expression into the Euler Lagrange equation, that it is a solution to the Euler Lagrange equation. So that's how we came up with this solution. And we uh, understood that the Bose Einstein condensate does require a very low temperature, like a, a, a nano Kelvin uh, orders of magnitude, when you want to create it from a dilute gas of atoms where typical interatomic spacing is something like a thousand angstrom. And so we did this uh, simple estimate. And as a result, the people did actually manage to produce this Bose-Einstein condensate in the laboratory. And this is the MIT group using sodium, I think. And you can clearly see this fringe pattern. And this fringe pattern is really a fringe pattern of a classical field because the fringe pattern in quantum mechanics has to help, uh, requires repeated measurements over and over, over again, and only based on probabilistic basis, you start to see the fringe pattern. But here, this is a fringe pattern all at once. So this is really a phenomenon of a classical wave-like behavior of these thousands of atoms working together. So this is the evidence of this coherent, uh, the classical wave-like behavior of the matter uh, in, ex in experimental data. And then we look at the excitation over this uh, uh, Bose-Einstein condensate by linearizing the Euler-Lagrange equation. And uh, uh, this is very simple <coughs> algebra to do. So you came up with this spectrum called the Bogoboduva spectrum, which depends not only on the usual kinetic energy of the particle, but also on the chemical potential. And chemical potential, as you uh, recall, is uh, supposed to be positive. So uh, this is the well-defined spectrum. And they, again, it agrees with the experiment just beautifully. And so that's how we confirm that our description of Bose-Einstein condensate using classical field theory is actually experimentally verified. So uh, at the beginning, I'm sure you would, you know, felt sort of bizarre 
to take the quantum field theory, which we came up with uh, by looking at the model particle quantum mechanics and so on. And all of a sudden, we start to look at the classical field theory of that. But now you see the experimental verification that it does make sense. So uh, that's how uh, we came up with this idea. And uh, I think Ryan was asking the question, so this spectrum of Bogolyubov uh, uh, spectrum doesn't seem to depend on this self-repelling uh, interaction. It actually it does. So if we actually use this uh, expression that the number density is given by mu over lambda, I can write mu as lambda rho. So this actually does depend on the uh, self-repelling uh, 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 self repelling uh, interaction. So the point here is that because th these atoms repel each other, they, they want to be as far as from e uh, each other as possible. But in this experiment, you are putting that into a potential trap using magnetic field. So uh, you have to squeeze certain number of atoms into a finite volume. And by doing so, we are fixing this uh, number density fixed. And for a fixed number density, chemical potential is actually proportional to this repulsive interaction. And that's exactly sort of intuition I tried to give, I think, uh, a week ago. So the meaning of chem chemical potential is how much you have to pay the energy cost when you introduce a, a particle, or in this case, with a sign of positive chemical potential, how much energy is given to the system when you introduce one additional particle. And when the system has self-repulsion, they don't want to have more particles in it because you, know, you want to repel them away. So, uh, but by having this new chemical potential as a sort of bribe, so if you accept one more particle, I give you a chocolate. So that's the idea of this positive chemical potential. So that's why chemical potential is indeed proportional to this strength of the repulsive interaction among atoms. So uh, that's the way this Bogolyubov spectrum actually does depend on this repulsive interaction. And, and cr more crucially, depends on the sign of that. Okay, and, and I, I didn't have uh, time, uh, time to actually write it into Piazza, but uh, does that answer your question, Ryan? Ah, uh, yes, yes. And I will also like check it later after this course. Okay. This, uh, after this class, so, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good. So anyway, so this is the beautiful experimental verification of this description using classical field on the Bose-Einstein condensate. And we also talked about this persistent flow and that there was this formula I wrote down out of the blue and I did not explain. So that's something I, I would come back now and try to explain what that is. But this expression has the meaning of a current, namely how many particles are, following, are, are flowing through a surface so, uh, uh, area per time. So if you look at this ring over here, Let's say you put a, 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 a sheet of paper uh, uh, intersecting this uh, tube, and then this Bose-Einstein condensate tries to flow through, a punch through a hole, and, and flow through the piece of paper, and you count how many atoms uh, went through the sheet of paper per unit area per time, and that is the physical meaning of this current. And I, I'll tell you more about this in the next slide. And what you're verifying the homework problem is that if you take this combination, it's called circulation, then it is quantized in the unit of Planck constant over the mass uh, with some integer coefficient in front of it. So what I did um, not explain, Hitoshi, oh, go ahead, go ahead. And we, there's a window labeled build order, which is overlapping some of the screen share that you're doing on oh, that okay. uh, expression that you were just describing. This? No, there's a window. Yeah, right? that window. It's on the on the screen share that we're seeing. It's overlapping with that expression. Ah, probably this one. Okay, thank you for pointing that out. So I'll go back to Zoom, share screen, and full screen. And I see chats, maybe on the same issue. Yeah, we see that window to me too. Yeah, okay. Is it gone now? Yeah. Okay, yes. good. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, so this is exactly the point I was referring to. So this circulation uh, is quantized 
in the unit of Planck constant over the mass of the atom. So let me elaborate on these points uh, a little bit so that I hope you, it would, uh, everything makes better sense. So uh, uh, what, we, what is the current, right? So once you have this Lagrangian, then as you would do in any physical systems, uh, in mechanics and, and, and so on, uh, one, one thing you would like to know is what symmetry this Lagrangian has. And we talked about the fact that this Lagrangian is independent of the reference frame, it's Galilean invariant, but there are more symmetries, namely that if you just change the phase of the field, it's not changing the Lagrangian. So the reason why talking about symmetry is important for us is because of the Neuter's theorem. Uh, I, I hope everyone knows this. So for every symmetry you have in the system, there's a conservation law. When there's a symmetry of translation in time, if there's no origin of time, then you have the conservation of energy. And when, when you have a symmetry of translation in space, if there's no origin in space, then there's a conservation law of momentum. If the system is rotationally invariant, then you have the conservation law of angular momentum. So uh, for every symmetry, there is a conservation law. And as I already mentioned, this particular Lagrangian is invariant when you actually substitute the field with additional phase factor into the Lagrangian. Because if you look at the every term, whenever there's psi, there's a psi dagger. Psi, psi dagger. Psi, psi dagger. Psi, psi, psi dagger, psi dagger. So for every psi, there's a psi dagger in every term in the Lagrangian. So even if you change the phase of the field, Lagrangian doesn't change, and that's a symmetry. And it may look very abstract to you that, you know, changing phase, of course, uh, it's a symmetry because it doesn't matter. All you do is to take the absolute square to get the number density. So, uh, you know, that's sort of a, uh, some unphysical thing. Uh, we don't care, you might say that. But it turns out that this phase invariance does lead to the conservation law, and that is the conservation of number of particles. And you sort of see it. We talked about this number phase uncertainty in principle, and the changing phase is canonically conjugate to the number. So the fact that Lagrangian is invariant under this phase change of the field is what leads to the conservation law of the total number of the atoms in the system. So psi dag of psi is the number density as a, at the position x. If you integrate it over the entire volume, then you count it the, the total number of particles in the system. In the same way that in the case of harmonic oscillator, a dagger a is the number operator. So this is the field theory generalization of that. And but field theory is local. Everything depends on X and T. So of course, it's, it's good that this number operator is conserved and that was of course makes sense. But uh, is there a local version of this? Now, before getting into this, I forgot to mention one thing. So uh, I, I did mention that there is this uh, invariance of changing the phase of Psi because there's always one Psi is accompanied by one Psi dagger and, and so on and so forth. Now, now that you have this interpretation that Psi is an annihilation operator and Psi dagger is a creation operator, having same number of Psi and Psi dagger means that whenever you annihilate a particle, you create a particle at the same time. Here, you annihilate two particles and you create two particles. So the fact that every term in the Lagrangian has the same number of Psi and Psi dagger means you are not changing the number of particles using this Lagrangian or Hamiltonian. So the fact that invariance under this phase change of Psi is the same thing as having the same number of Psi and Psi dagger in every term in the Lagrangian, which is the same thing as conserving the number because whenever you annihilate particles, you create the same number of particles. So how, that's how this invariance and the change of the phase of the field has to do with the conservation law of the number of the particles. Does that make sense to you? Let me pause here. I guess it does. Okay, so then what do you do is this. So take this number density, 
sub psi dag of psi. And when you integrate this over volume, you get this conserved total number of atoms. But if you take the time derivative of the number density, what do you get? So time derivative of rho means psi dag of psi dot and psi dot dag of psi, right? So this is just the uh, Leibniz rule. And then using this Euler-Lagrange equation, psi dot can be rewritten in terms of the right-hand side of this Euler-Lagrange equation. And if I do that, I get this first term over IH bar, a plus additional pieces that has psi dagger with these. So negative mu psi dagger psi plus lambda psi dagger psi dagger psi psi. On the other hand, when I look at this term here, I have psi dot dagger. And so I can rewrite it using this euler lagrange equation with complex conjugated form. So if I take complex conjugate, I get negative IH bar psi dagger dot given by the complex conjugate of the right-hand side. And thanks to the negative sign you get over here, the piece I got from psi dagger times these two terms and now new pieces I get from psi dot dagger times psi, which contains this one dagger psi, this one dagger psi, but together with the overall minus sign, these things cancel. So the only thing that remains is the piece with derivative. So it's easy to check that you get this form at the end of the day. But once you have this form, it's also easy to check that I can take this derivative out with this form. And the way you can see it is that when this derivative goes together with this derivative, that would reproduce this first term. But I have additional piece where this derivative acts on this psi dagger instead, together with derivative on psi. So, but that piece is canceled by this derivative acting on this psi because both of them end up having grad psi dagger grad psi minus grad psi dagger grad psi. So they cancel. So the thing that remains in the end is this derivative acting on this psi dagger and that reproduces the second term on the previous line. So what do you see here is that time derivative of the number density is now written as a divergence of some vector j. And this is the form you may have seen elsewhere. And this is one example of what is called the continuity equation. And I'll explain what I mean by that on the next slide. But anyway, let me stop here. Are there any questions about this? Okay. You guys are quiet today. <laughs> I don't know. So uh, I got this time derivative of the number density given by divergence of a current. So uh, why is that important? So this is what I said, it's a continuity equation. And continuity equation actually gives you the conservation of total number in the following way. So if I take the time derivative of the total number of particles, n, uh, so n is now given in terms of spatial integral of the number density rho, and uh, time, no, sorry, the spatial integral has nothing with the time, so this time derivative would be the partial derivative with respect to time of the number density. And this is now partial derivative because the, the number density depends both on time and also space. But here I use this continuity equation to rewrite this time derivative of the number density by a divergence of this current. But then I can use Gauss's law to rewrite this volume integral of the divergence by a surface integral of this vector in the normal direction. And uh, I didn't have time to create a picture of this, 
but the idea is that uh, you have um, uh, this, uh, 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 oops, I sometimes get confused and I try to tap on the screen. Um, okay. So what I'm trying to say is that So if you have a volume inside a sphere, then inside a sphere, you integrate number density, which is the total number of particles inside the sphere. So let's say this is radius r. And what this continuity equation told us is that time derivative of the number of particle inside the sphere is given by surface integral of the current with a negative sign. Namely that if you have particles, oops, sorry. If you have particles flowing out like this from the surface, What this quantity tells you is that number of particles and current is number of particles per area, I told you. This is per area. But this is nothing but area. So then you're looking at a total area. And current is per area per time. So per time is still there. So this expression is the number of particles that flow out from the surface per unit time. So that is what makes sense here, that how much particles you gain is the negative of how, much particle, how many particles that have flown out to the surface. So that's the physical meaning of this continuity equation. So that's why the expression we had uh, on the previous slide about this number current which satisfies this continuity equation has the meaning of particles flowing through a unit area per unit time. And in case where you take the surface to infinity then there's nothing that go out from the infinity. So uh, this surface term can then be ignored. Then you find that time derivative of the number of particles vanishes and that's the conservation law. So the continuity equation is a local version of the conservation law where how much you lose the conserved quantity, in this case, number of particles, has to do with how much of the quantity flows in and out on the surface of the, your volume. And when you take the surface to infinity, then you reproduce the original conservation law that Emily Neuter told us based on that symmetry. So that's the connection between the current I introduced when I talked about the circulation of the persistent current in both einstein condensate and that current, now you see the physical meaning of it, is literally how many particles are flowing through per unit area per unit time. And the fact that this current makes sense is because of this conservation law. So this current operator satisfies this continuity equation and spatial integral of the, the number density is indeed the conserved charge when you send the uh, uh, spatial uh, uh, surface to spatial infinity. Okay, so this is, I wanted to convey why you were looking at this specific form of the current in your homework problem. And in your homework problem, of course, we are looking only in the direction of this, uh, along this tube where the Bose-Einstein condensate is put into. And that's why in this case, I'm only looking at the theta direction, angular direction of this current. And that's exactly what you're looking at in the last parts of the current homework problem. Okay, any questions about this?
All right. Uh, you guys are really quiet today. I'm getting a little bothered. <laughs> okay, so now I need to stop sharing. Okay. Now back to sharing this screen. Oops. Okay, back to the slide. So, so this is what we are talking about. So there is this continuity equation and we derived what J should be based on this continuity equation because this time derivative of the number density using euler lagrange equation was written in terms of divergence of current where current was defined by this expression. So this is what I said when I was scribbling on an iPad so this expression is supposed to be the current. So now you know the why this combination of the field with derivative on it has the physical meaning of how many particles have thrown through a unit area per unit time. Okay. And then we have a uh, look at this experimental data that this kind of persistent flow is indeed possible. And there's a special protection on this state because this is described by integer numbers. So the only way you can lose it by a jump, not continuously degrading the current, like what you normally see due to friction and viscosity in normal fluid, but both Einstein condensate doesn't do that. So it keeps flowing until all of a sudden it makes a jump to go to from two to one and one to zero. So as long as both Einstein condensate keeps flowing, then it doesn't have any viscosity or uh, friction. And that's the meaning of the word superfluid. So this is the fluid with zero viscosity, zero friction. So as long as BEC itself is intact, it just keeps flowing. So in that sense, this is called persistent flow. Of course, I told you last week already that BEC itself is in some sense a little unstable because once the different atoms start to stick with each other and form molecules, then the condensate can disappear, and indeed it does. So normal BEC would kind of disappear fairly quickly, but with this finite end of the persistent current, it survives a lot longer because of this topological protection. Uh, it has to jump. The, all the thousands of atoms together have to make a jump altogether which is not easy to do. And as a result, there is this protection that, that this persistent current is actually a long lift compared to uh, uh, the, the otherwise. And so there, there was a question from uh, 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 Andrew about topological, topological nature of this. So I, I told you about this, uh, and this is the quantum vortex. And the, once you actually remove this potential, to confine this both Einstein condensate inside this tube, then you end up finding this vortex where the origin looks a little singular, but that's where the number density of the condensate actually vanishes. And very similar to this persistent current we talked about, the phase of the field goes around once or twice or on any integer times. And when I plot this current I mentioned on two slides ago, which we derive from the continuity equation, this current really does show how the particles are flowing. And so this is the visual representation that talking about this current makes sense. So this is the vortex, like tornado. So things are sort of circling around on this origin. And this current really does represent that kind of collective motion of the both tension condensate around this origin. So that's the vortex we talked about. We have seen the experimental results on that too. But here's one little thing I wanted to add to this uh, because of this question I was asked about why this has to do with the topology. And so yeah, I got some extra thing I didn't need in there. Uh, okay, never mind. So uh, the idea is that the field we came up with is basically constant times a phase. And if you stick in this expression to the current, 
then this constant, it's the number density, is now squared. There's over h power of m. <clears throat> but then this phase is the piece that has the theta dependence. So what you get is the theta derivative of the phase. And when you stick this into the definition of the circulation, <coughs> it's the v dot dx, <coughs> excuse me. Okay. Then you are now computing that this indeed gives you this quantized value. But the connection to topology is that when you actually look at this expression here, this integral is nothing but you are integrating derivative of alpha with respect to theta by theta. So this is just sort of trivial integral of looking at the surface values of this integral when theta goes from zero to two pi. But this alpha is a phase. So phase is defined only modulo two pi. So this phase can go from zero to two pi when you do this theta integral. And it may be two pi times two, maybe negative two pi, it may be two pi, two, two, two pi times 100, but it's always two pi times an integer when you go around the full circle. And that's how you recover this integer. And for those of you who study a little bit about the topology uh, in, in the math class, and this is really indeed a what is called the cohomology class of, of, over this uh, uh, the circle. And if this doesn't make sense to you, that's totally okay. The main point is that this topological argument is very robust because it doesn't matter what's going on in between. Once you secure the two ends in theta, the answer is fixed. And we know the answer has to be integer multiple because this is how much phase is allowed to change when you go back to the original position. So that's why this kind of topological reasoning is very powerful. It doesn't depend on much of the details. It depends only on sort of, you know, constraining the system from outside. And then you get this very uh, uh, strong claim that the circulation is an integer multiple of H over M, which is not affected by, for example, if there's any impurity in the system, is there some complicated geometry, maybe it's not exact circle, but elongated, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter on any of these details, as long as you have a field that goes around the circle or ellipse or whatever more complicated shape, it could be even polygons, but you still get the same answer that circulation is quantized in the same unit because of this property that it depends only on the boundary conditions. So I hope that would answer the questions some of you might have had. And uh, if you don't care about this, that's totally okay too. So anyway, let me pause here if there are any questions. Um, okay, I'd oh, go ahead. Yeah, why does the field go to zero at um, zero? That is it just- Yeah. Right? Yeah, so that needs to go back to the previous slide. Oops, sorry, this slide. Oops. Uh, I'm sorry, I lost it. So what I meant to show, yeah, I made an editing error. Uh, just hold on. Okay, so the point is this one. So as I said, when you go around the origin, then the phase of the field goes around a full circle once, that's this e to the i theta. And that, how many times you go around, the, the, go, the, the phase go around uh, the, the, uh, by going full circle is this number n uh, I kept talking about. But this phase theta, namely this is azimuthal angle on this plane, is ill-defined at the origin. When r is zero, then the changing theta doesn't make the point move, it's still the origin, 
So theta azimuthal angle is ill-defined at the origin. So if you write this expression, this is okay at spatial infinity or some finite radius because azimuthal angle is well-defined, but specifically at the origin, this becomes ill-defined. So the only way to make it consistent is that this field itself as a whole vanishes. Then it doesn't matter that uh, the azimuthal angle is well-defined, zero is zero. So that's the reason why the field has to vanish at the origin because of this phase factor no longer matters. But once you go to finite radius, then field has a finite amplitude. And you do have this non-trivial phase that goes with the azimuthal angle, but that's okay because azimuthal angle is a well-defined angle at a finite radius. So field has to vanish at the origin or anywhere you like. It has to vanish at least somewhere. And so that this azimuthal angle can make sense and overall, you can have this overall phase change when you move around the circle by integer times. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, and I guess just a quick follow up. How is the quantum vortex different from persistent flow? Um, or I guess what's the relationship? Well, yeah, it is, it is the same thing. So this current you see in this visual representation of the current is indeed the supercurrent. So if you have a vortex, the fluid is going around and again with zero viscosity and it can keeps flowing uh, forever as long as PEC itself persists. Okay, so they're essentially the same. Yeah, uh, it's just the same thing, yeah. Okay. So the only thing is that now that we remove the barrier so we can talk about the spatially continuous configuration of the field, that's why you have to be aware that field has to vanish at the origin, but nonetheless, it's the same physics in the same super fluid. Okay, so we just replaced the, I guess the infinite potential at the center mm -hmm. or some mm -hmm. in a large potential with mm -hmm. now just a vanishing vortex. Right, so, exactly, okay. right. Good, thank you for asking that question, Sahil. Any other questions here? Uh, professor, you just keep talking about um, this flow, that flow, but the thing that I can only see is the title of quantum vortex and the Lagrangian. Oh, okay. And I asked in the, in, yeah, I also asked Thank in you. the chat Thank box. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, uh, I realized that I made a mistake again. So if I have multiple windows open in Keynote, apparently the slides don't uh, advance. So sorry about that. So the, this flow, that flow I was referring to is this picture. And okay. so all you do is to take the configuration with amplitude given by this, but together with this phase factor as a function of azimuthal angle, I plug that into this expression of the current and I just put that uh, in uh, visually depicted in this uh, plot. And you can really see that the current is flowing around the origin. And this is what is go going on with this vortex solution. Sorry about that. Does it make sense now? Mm, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good. Anything else? And there were chats probably on the same problem. Oh yeah, thank you. So I should have paid attention to that. Good. So I talked about this already and you have seen this picture too. And, and this looks beautiful. So you have multiple vortices in a single BEC. And because each vortex actually repel each other by a logarithmic potential between them. That's also something you can compute with the Lagrangian by putting in two vortices into the Lagrangian and compute the total energy. And then you find this logarithmic uh, repulsive potential between the vortices. So they would like to be away from each other as possible. And so that ends up forming these beautiful triangular lattices. And somebody was joking, and I, I, I didn't mention this, that they are socially distancing with each other. So that's perfect. Hopefully this is six feet. All right, but one can also ask the following question. So everything made sense with the repulsive interaction. What happens when you talk about an attractive interaction? And uh, I explained this actually after the class last week for those of you who stayed on to ask questions, but I didn't discuss in class, so I have to do this again. 
So remember, the sign of this lambda had to do with this delta function interaction potential among particles in multi-particle quantum mechanics, because the field theory, quantum field theory, is equivalent to multi-particle quantum mechanics. We did this interpretation that, that this term over here would correspond to this kind of potential among particles in quantum mechanics. And you have done this with the previous homework problem for three body state. So you know this already. <coughs> Excuse me again. And uh, in the case of the QFT, this thing in yellow is the Hamiltonian. And for psi, that space time uh, constant, the first term vanishes. So you have only these two terms. So these two terms actually is the Hamiltonian itself. And this is what is called the potential as a function of the field, as opposed to potential as a function of the position of particles. So this is sort of the new thing you have in QFT, which you didn't have in quantum mechanics. But anyway, so if you plot this, you have seen this picture already. And then if you put the ball at the top, then it starts to roll down the hill, but you still find this stable place where a particle can roll down to and stay there forever. So that is where we found the solution to the equation to the, uh, the or the Heisenberg equation for the field, and that described the condensate at rest, not condensate flowing, condensate at rest. So that's what we have done so far, but that doesn't require positive lambda. In, in the case of these uh, uh, experiments with the uh, 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 atoms in, in both and condensate, in some cases, you can dial electric and magnetic field to change the interaction among atoms. So just by turning a dial, what used to be a repulsive interaction can turn into no interaction at all. And by further turning the knob, it becomes an attractive interaction. Then observe what would happen to the Bose-Einstein condensate. But you can guess what should happen. So if you change the sign of lambda, then this potential I have drawn here doesn't have this positive slope going up to a large potential due to this quartic term. But now that this is negative, it doesn't go up, it goes down. So the potential would look like that. And if you put ball on top of this, then of course starts to roll down the hill. And remember, this potential is drawn on the complex plane of psi. This is the real part of psi, this is the imaginary part of psi, the same here. This direction, the real part of psi, this direction, the imaginary part of psi. So this ball rolling down the hill means the value of psi keeps getting larger and larger and eventually becomes infinite because nothing would stop it. So when psi goes to infinity, what means the density goes to infinity, number density goes to infinity. So your prediction then would be that, okay, as long as lambda is positive, you have this stable configuration, which corresponds to a bose einstein condensate at rest. But when somebody turns the knob and make lambda to have a negative value now, then the density wants to go to infinity. The only way that can happen is the whole thing would go the both stack condensate will collapse to a point. And that will be your prediction where, what happens when the lambda goes to negative, namely that for an attractive force among atoms, you cannot form a stable bose einstein condensate. Any questions about this? It's okay. I, uh, Professor, I, I have a question about, it's not the, about the content, but about the read that you just wrote in this slide. So, um, so in, in the L, in the L Lagrangian, you wrote like negative lambda times mm -hmm. two precise and uh, two dagger, precise dagger and two precise. Mm -hmm. But in the middle of this slide, you wrote V equals like plus half lambda times the side to the power of four. So is that Sorry? A, this one? A typo or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, 
They should have been a factor of half here. Yeah, so that's a type. Okay. Yes. Then, okay. They should then have been a factor of half. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. I will fix it. Anything else? Um, do we interpret psi, um, I guess in this case, as the uh, number density of the particles? Is that, I guess, well, yeah, the psi, like of psi is the number density, right? So yeah, okay. we verified that with this current idea. Okay, makes sense. Thank you for the question. Anything else? All right. And uh, this is the experiment. So uh, what they did, is to create a Bose-Einstein condensate first, and then by turning the knob, the, the whole thing went swoosh, and, and this is the state of the collapse. But after all the atoms collapsed to a point, then there was a rebound, that everything started to go poop. And this is what they called Bose-Nova. And some of you might know this name, supernova. So you know when you have a fairly massive star, that keeps shining for uh, millions of years, but then it runs out of fuel, then the whole thing would now collapse by the pull of gravity. So once stars stop producing heat, then it cannot support its own weight. Gravity can only pull. So if there's nothing that works against the gravity with the pressure, if you lose pressure, the whole thing would collapse. And that's when you might form a black hole, for example. But when everything starts to collapse to the center of the, the star, there's again rebound, and that leads to an explosion, and that is what is called the supernova. And the typical supernova becomes as bright as the entire galaxy, and if there is a supernova in our own galaxy, you should be able to see that actually in the uh, broad daylight. And the famous Bethlehem star in the Bible is, is uh, apparently supernova. So uh, this is some, something that's a very dramatic event in astronomy, which doesn't happen very often, maybe uh, once or twice in a century or something. But anyway, so that's the supernova. So uh, they took this supernova as an inspiration and called that a bosonova. So let's watch bosonova. So that's the explosion. So uh, all this blue stuff is the atoms flying apart from each other by this rebound after the collapse. So as you see that when you have the attractive potential uh, among the atoms, then you do not have a stable Bose-Einstein condensate. Things start to collapse and rebound leading to this explosion and let all the, fly, the atoms fly apart from each other. So that's the idea of Bosnova. So you see this importance of the sign in this quartic term in the Hamiltonian in action. That's very important. And uh, uh, so uh, in, I hope everything makes sense because negative lambda would, would correspond to this potential that just keeps going down indefinitely and the ball starts to keep running down to an infinite value of the field, therefore infinite density. Okay, any questions about this? Well, what causes the rebound specifically? Is it because I guess predicted from the equation, we would just anticipate the density go to infinity, but is yeah. there a different things that causes the rebound? Yeah, so that's an excellent question too. So what I discussed is in some sense a little bit of an oversimplification. So when you turn the knob and to make the interaction between the atoms attractive, they attract with delta function, which is meant to be an approximation of a short range attraction. But when they come really short range to the extent that atoms are really touching each other, then there is actually a repulsive interaction again. So if you plot the potential as a function of the distance, it starts to go down, which corresponds to attractive potential. But then there is repulsive core, which corresponds to repulsive interaction when they are really, really close to each other. So uh, describing it using this little lambda is a oversimplification because I'm only talking about sort of overall attractive potential looking from afar, what happens when you close in. But when you really close in, then they it repel with each other. So that was is what's lead to this rebound. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, thanks. Okay, good. Any further questions? Anyway, I, I found this movie really cool. It's a Bose Nova, remember that. Okay, now here's a little uh, history question to you, 
So we talked about this Bose-Einstein condensate. And the Bose-Einstein condensate was actually predicted by Albert Einstein, and I'm not sure I can read the name, Sachendra Nath Bose in 20, uh, 1920s, hence Bose-Einstein condensate, Bose, an Indian physicist. But it was not discovered experimental until 1995. So this was actually a long time in, in the works and uh, it took a you know, really tremendous technological development to be able to produce it. So the question is yes and no. Yes or no, I apologize. Okay. Still like five more people to go. Okay. All right, not everybody voted, but let me stop here. So the answer is, the poll result is overwhelmingly yes. So the bose ancient condensate was not discovered in 1995. It turns out though, that it was actually discovered much earlier. It was not discovered in this dilute gas of atoms initially, but it was discovered in the form of the liquid helium-4. So when you have the gas of helium-4, which you use in the, you know, the birthday parties in balloons, and if you cool it down, eventually that becomes a liquid. And at the, the, root, the, uh, the atmospheric pressure, it turns out that the helium-4 would never become a crystal. It never solidifies. Even at the zero Kelvin, at absolute zero, it stays actually liquid. And in particular, it becomes a superfluid. And uh, when I actually Googled around, somehow this very old looking uh, video of BBC showed up. So let me play that. But I guess I have to make sure that uh, I, have to have, <coughs> I have the sound on. And I'm not sure I did, so let me make sure of that. Here we go. There were more surprises ahead. In the 1930s, another strange phenomenon was observed at even lower temperatures. This rapidly evaporating liquid helium cools until at two degrees above absolute zero, a dramatic transformation takes place. Suddenly, you see that the bubbling stops and that the surface of the liquid helium is completely still. The temperature is actually being lowered even further now, but nothing particularly is happening. Well, this, this is really one of the great phenomena in, in 20th century physics. The liquid helium had turned into a superfluid, which displays some really odd properties. Here I have a beaker with an unglazed ceramic bottom of ultrafine porosity. Ordinarily, this container with tiny pores can hold liquid helium. But the moment the helium turns superfluid, it leaks through. We call this kind of flow a superflow. Superfluid helium can do things we might have believed impossible. It appears to defy gravity. A thin film can climb walls and escape its container. This is because a superfluid has zero viscosity. It can even produce a frictionless fountain, one that never stops flowing. Superfluidity and superconductivity were baffling concepts for scientists. New radical theories were needed to explain them. And you have this new radical theory called classical field theory. So that, that's what we use to describe indeed the superfluid helium. So this is the phase diagram of uh, helium-4. So at high temperature, of course, this is very low. The high temperature, of course, the helium is a gas. And uh, once come down to uh, several Kelvins down here, becomes a normal liquid. So this is actually a, a liquid which can flow, but has friction and viscosity. But when you get down to this, around two Kelvin, and there's a phase transition, and the helium becomes a superfluid. And this temperature is a lot higher, it's not nano Kelvin, only a few Kelvin, so uh, it's a lot higher temperature, of course low temperature nonetheless, but a lot higher than nano Kelvin. And that's because 
In this case, we are not talking about dilute gas. So into atomic spacing D is of the order of an angstrom. So in some sense, helium atoms are in a shoulder to shoulder. And that's not what we're supposed to do during pandemic, right? You have to keep social distancing. But here they are really shoulder to shoulder. So uh, it's like in a crowded bar or uh, disco or whatever. So uh, this is very dense uh, object. And once interatomic spacing is short, then the temperature, uh, which where the de Broglie wavelength starts to become sort of letting the, uh, the bosons overlap with each other, is actually not that low. So this is about a Kelvin. So just by, by doing this, this kind of simple dimensional estimate, you can already see that when atoms are really shoulder to shoulder, then the temperature for, uh, for the Bose-Einstein condensate can be a lot higher than nano Kelvin. And that's indeed what you're seeing here. And the reason why I didn't talk about this first, even though this was the first discovery of Bose-Einstein condensate, is that liquid helium-4 is a little bit more difficult to understand uh, theoretically because the atoms are really shoulder to shoulder, simply saying that there is a repulsive force, which is short range, approximate delta function, is not a good enough description because they are so slow, slow, close to each other. So it doesn't make sense to say, okay, that's a delta function potential. You have to specify the system a little bit better. And it also turns out that the strength of this repulsive force is pretty strong in the case of uh, uh, liquid helium. So uh, treating it as a weak interaction is actually not a good approximation. So there are actually more quantum effects you have to consider. And so things become a little bit more complicated. And you see the example why this actually becomes complicated on this slide. So when you remember the Bogolyubov spectrum, it starts out linear and then goes to quadratic. And that's what you have also seen in the experimental data in the Bose-Einstein condensate of dilute gas of atoms. But in the case of the liquid helium, people have done this experiment with the neutron scattering. You send a neutron in, knock nucleus of a hydro, uh, a, a, uh, the helium inside the superfluid and measure the, uh, the energy momentum of neutron that came back. And by using energy momentum conservation, you can tell how much momentum is deposited for what energy, and you just keep plotting it like this, then you find this weird dip. And this dip has a name called Roton. And from what I, I think I know from the history, this is a name given by Richard Feynman, which turned out to be a wrong name. He somehow had this idea that this dip has to do with the rotation of the fluid, like a vortex we have talked about earlier, but it doesn't. This has nothing to do with the rotation, so, but name stuck. So this is called the roton dip. It has nothing to do with rotation, unfortunately, so that's a misnomer. But anyway, that's a name that got stuck. And the reason why we don't have the same Bogorilov spectrum, but have spectrum with this dip, has to do with the fact that repulsive interaction among the atoms is no longer just simple delta function, but you really have to take care of the fact that there is a long range interaction within the distances the atoms move about. And if you look at the lecture notes, uh, I, I actually showed explicitly that how finite range of interaction would lead to a dip like this one. So that's why this is a little bit more complicated. So I don't really discuss this in this class. You're welcome to look at the lecture notes to get more information about it. But this kind of spectrum is actually very interesting because I can tell you why this kind of thing uh, loses viscosity and friction and keeps flowing forever. And as you saw on the video, then the, you know, this fluid really behaves in a very stable fashion without any friction or viscosity, climbs up the hole, wall and come down and, and keep dripping, go, can go through tiny, tiny pores at the bottom of the, of the beaker. So, you know, it really demonstrates that this is a very stable object, much more stable than the Bose-Einstein condensate of cold atoms we have looked at earlier. So now I can tell you what should be the criteria to decide if this kind of excitation spectrum would exhibit viscosity or not. And that is, goes back to the uh, Landau 
But anyway, so any questions on this slide? Okay, so when does a fluid become a superfluid? And that's the question. So the, when the fluid is superfluid, let's say this thing is the fluid, filled with fluid, moving to the left, and you put some obstacle inside, maybe some you know, steel ball or something, and if there's a friction, then this fluid would hit the ball and start losing uh, the, the velocity and momenta and by creating some microphysical excitations. So whenever there's a friction, if you have, for example, say, uh, uh, put a, a glove with a very rough surface on it and rub any, say, desk or something with that glove, then it, it becomes hot, right? And that, that's because the friction would turn the kinetic energy of your hand into microscopic excitations which correspond to mole motion of molecules. The motion of molecules is the heat. So you are changing macroscopic motion into microscopic excitations, and that's the origin of the friction. So the question you ask here is that when you have a flow hitting this obstacle, does it lead to creation of microscopic excitations according to this Persian relation we have seen between energy of uh, the uh, the, the relationship between energy and momentum of the microscopic uh, excitation. So that's the question we should ask. And the genius of Landau is that, okay, this looks like a difficult problem to ask, but everything is invariant under the change of reference frame by Galilean transformation. So well, let's, let's change the frame to this. So now you have a fluid at rest. And this macroscopic obstacle is moving inside. And when you move this macroscopic stuff inside this fluid, and of course, this macroscopic stuff is pushing and, and jiggling this fluid all along, and does it lead to some microscopic excitations? And if it does, then this macroscopic object will slow down because it loses energy. So if this macroscopic object flows down in the original reference frame, that will correspond to this flow slowing down. And that means there's a friction and viscosity. So the question we have to ask here is that when you move this macroscopic object inside this fluid at rest, can it slow down a bit by emitting this excitation in the system? And when you have excitation spectrum like this one, it turns out that you cannot do so simply because of the energy momentum conservation. So suppose you could emit this microscopic excitation to let this macroscopic object slow down. So what then should happen is that initial kinetic energy is half mv squared, and that turned into slightly slow motion so this is now lower kinetic energy by emitting this microscopic excitation of energy E. But you also need to conserve the momentum. So if you are emitting this object uh, in the same direction, then initial momentum M times V has to be the same as the final momentum where this macroscopic object did slow down to V prime, but emitted excitation carries this momentum away so that momentum is conserved. So in order to conserve energy and momentum for this macroscopic object to slow down by emitting this microscopic excitation should satisfy these requirements. So taking the second equation, I solve for V prime. I plug that into the right-hand side of the first equation. Then I find this. And because this thing is a macroscopic object, so this mass m is meant to be a huge number, I can ignore whatever is suppressed by one over m. Then I can cancel this half mv squared from both sides. Then you find the relationship, the energy and momentum of this microscopic excitation has to satisfy. 
which is linear. The point here is that this spectrum starts out linear, which is called phonon excitation. And that was true also for the cold atom BEC. In that case, it starts out linear and turns into quadratic. For the liquid helium, it turns around and goes up again. But it's still true that it starts out linear. So in order to satisfy this requirement, that energy of the microscopic excitation is momentum times the velocity of this macroscopic object, or in the original reference frame, velocity of the, the superfluid, they need to cross this spectrum. So if you draw this line, E equals VP, and if V is small, the line would look something like this. It would never cross this dispersion relation. So that's impossible. Namely, this macroscopic obstacle, obstacle cannot slow down by emitting this elementary excitation. Or going back to the original reference frame, this flow cannot slow down. Therefore, it keeps flowing without viscosity or friction. So that is the Landau's criteria to see whether your system would lead to a superfluid or not. But as you can see in the case of liquid helium, once the velocity becomes large enough, then this straight line can start to cross this dispersion relation. Then this macroscopic object is now allowed to emit the excitation right here to slow down, which means that this macroscopic object can keep emitting this to keep slowing down, then what that means is that in the original reference frame, the flow of the fluid can slow down. Therefore, there's a friction and viscosity. So whether this dispersion relation can cross this straight line is the criteria whether you can have viscosity or not. And for low velocity of the fluid, you cannot. So superfluid keeps flowing without viscosity and friction. But above certain velocity, you can emit this uh, elementary excitation for fluid to slow down. And this is the critical velocity. So once you have a dispersion relation like this one, then you can read off the critical velocity above which the superfluid does now have friction and can start to slow down. But below the critical velocity, it doesn't because there's no way to slow down allowed by energy momentum conservation and hence is a superfluid. And that's the Landau's criteria. And I think that's, oh no, there's one more thing. <clears throat> so that's, that's what I said. So, so this can be satisfied for this elementary excitation with this dispersion relation only when the velocity is above a certain critical velocity. And that's indeed what had been observed in uh, uh, superfluid lithium, uh, the uh, superfluid liquid helium four. Okay, let me stop here. Are there any questions on this? It's okay. All right, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> oh yeah, and so if the spectrum doesn't start out linear, but it's the normal spectrum of the point particle, p squared to m, then no matter how small this velocity is, it can always cross this parabolic behavior, right? Because this is a, a parabolic function, it's a square, so it starts out much more slowly at low momentum compared to something that's linear. So for normal dispersion relation of the non resistive particle, then no matter how low the velocity is, you can find a solution. So that's why for normal fluid, there's always viscosity because it can keep creating these uh, <coughs> microscopic excitations uh, and, and while satisfying energy momentum conservation. And so converting the macroscopic motion into a bunch of tiny microscopic excitations 
is turning actually uh, the kinetic energy into heat, and that's the origin of the friction. So you can see that this linear behavior <coughs> of the dispersion relation is indeed the key for both cold gas of atoms and the liquid helium-4 to become superfluid. And so that's a fluid without friction, satisfying Landau's criteria. All right? Good. So this wraps up the discussion on the Bose-Einstein condensate. So last thing I want to show is that you can have very similar vortex lattices in the liquid superhelium-4. So in that case, you don't need to manipulate this uh, with, with electric and magnetic field. You can literally produce the liquid helium in a piece of bucket or beaker. You have seen that video. And you literally rotate the bucket and that would start producing these vortices in the superfluid. <clears throat> and they again form a, a beautiful triangular lattice. So the physics is exactly the same as in the case of, case of the BEC of dilute gas of cold atoms. Okay, so that finishes up discussion on Bose-Einstein condensate. So any questions overall about this? So we talked about something really weird. We came up with a quantum field theory that reproduces the standard non-relativistic multiparticle quantum mechanics. So you got used to this idea with the previous homework problem. But it turns out that this quantum field theory has a classical limit, which also makes sense physically. And that is what describes this weird quantum state of matter, the fifth state of matter, according to some people. And uh, uh, that is this Bose-Einstein condensate of cold atoms or superfluid liquid helium-4. <clears throat> and uh, uh, so that's the field theory. So if you had been born in the world, surrounded by the superfluid liquid, uh, 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 the superfluid liquid helium-4, then you are used to this idea that you have a classical wave around you. Then you put that into Lagrangian. <clears throat> and then somebody tells you that, look, you have this classical field theory, but that is something you have to quantize, actually. Then you say, no way, that sounds so weird. We don't want to do that. But if you come up with a mechanism to heat up your environment by terrible global warming, I guess, if you build a large hadron collider in your laboratory and inject energy into your environment, you can see that your superfluid around you would have helium atom knocked out of it. And all of a sudden you realize that, oh, okay, this wave is actually made of particles. And then you have to accept the fact that it needs to be quantized. So that's the opposite way we have gone in quantum mechanics class, <clears throat> because you are used to the world that everything is made of particles. We are made of atoms. We know they are particles. So we are more familiar to the idea of particles. That's why we start with them and then quantize it to get the wave out following a Schrodinger equation. But in this hypothetical world where you live together with the superfluid helium, then classical wave is something you are used to, and you are not used to the fact that this wave is actually made of atoms, particles, and that's something you have to embrace after the fact by learning you are supposed to quantize this wave, and then you get particles out of it. So that's just the opposite direction from what we normally go, but this is the direction we use when we go to photons. Because in the case of electromagnetic wave, we are used to the fact that electromagnetic wave is a wave. And that's why we can use Wi-Fi and, and cell phones. <coughs> because you have this classical electromagnetic wave emitted by antenna in your Wi-Fi router that will come to your computer or iPad and you can communicate by the radio signal. So we're used to this idea that electromagnetic wave is a wave like this hypothetical person living together with the superfluid helium. But because we're used to this idea that electromagnetic wave is a wave, then we have a surprise that in certain cases, the wave starts to behave as a collection of individual photons. And that's the step we are going to take in a couple of weeks when we look at the Maxwell equation, <clears throat> 
we write the classical field theory Lagrangian for it, then quantize it to get the individual photons out of that in much the same way we did by quantizing Schrodinger field to get the multiparticle quantum mechanics out of it. So that's why I'm spending actually a fair amount of time on this Bose-Einstein condensate stuff because this whole concept of particle wave duality is, is really shown very clearly when you look at this weird system like Bose-Einstein condensate where the classical limit, low energy limit is really made up of waves, but only after quantizing the wave, you get particles out. And that's the exact the same set of steps we're gonna follow with for getting the photon out of the Maxwell's equation. And that's just a preview, but I hope that makes sense better now. Any questions on this? Anna wants to speak, looks like, looks like. Oh no, okay. Anybody else? Uh, excuse me, I have a question like, uh, about the fifth that you just mentioned. So that, but in normal materials, like uh, just no, they contain electrons. Mm -hmm. But electrons mm -hmm. are fermions. And mm -hmm. really the next slide reminds me. So how can they form like BEC you mentioned as the fifth state? Because fermions are fermions. They cannot yeah. like, occupy, yeah, an occupy the same object. That's an excellent question. And, and so th th we do move into fermions uh, in, a, a, I guess, on Friday. Uh, so uh, the idea is that fermion would not form a Bose-Einstein condensate because it turns out the fermion is described by a field which never becomes a number in the ordinary sense. And that's something I'm gonna explain uh, actually starting here and I can just flash it and we will discuss this again on Friday. So idea is that uh, there's a particle exclusion principle. So many bosons can occur the same state and that's how we get the Bose-Einstein condensate. But, and that was because of this canonical communication relation among creation and nation operators. So A daggers commute. So you can keep acting A dagger on the ground state to put more and more particles into the same quantum state. And that was because of the boson. But in the case of fermion, you can't do that. Only one fermion can occupy a state. So you have a binary choice whether you have a fermion or not. It's zero or one, so it's a binary choice. It turns out in order to actually get this situation on a Hilbert space, you again use creation and addition operators, but instead of a commutation relation, they satisfy anti-commutation relation. So anti-commutator with the curly braces of A and B operators is AB plus BA instead of AB minus BA, and hence anti-commutator. And now that you know that the field operator is an addition operator, now you see the annihilation operators anti-commutes with itself. So when you multiply two fields, and change the order, you get a minus sign. So that's a weird number. And that kind of number is called Grassmann number, which is on this slide. And again, I'll come back and talk about this on Friday, so don't worry about any of the details here. But if you take the classical limit of the fermion field, you have to accept the fact this fermion field is actually an anti-commuting object. And so that's a number that changes sign when you change the order among each other. And that's a very weird object. It's not a normal number. But mathematic mathematically, you can define such a number that anti-commutes among each other and it has a name called the Grassmann number. So this is actually not the kind of number we are normally familiar with. And as a result, fermion field can never become a macroscopic function of space and time in a normal fashion. And so this is the way we see from the QFT point of view that fermions would never form a Bose-Einstein condensate. But to quickly answer Ryan's question, if you have two fermions which collectively move together, then two fermions 
is a boson. And once two fermions are always moving together, together they can form a Bose-Einstein condensate. And that is what indeed can happen with the superfluid liquid helium-3. Helium-3 has a nucleus made of two protons and one neutron, so that's the three fermions, together with two electrons around it, so that's five fermions altogether. So helium-3 atom is a fermion. But if you go down to slightly lower temperature in a middle Kelvin, it turns out that there's some attractive force between two helium-3 atoms, so they can start to behave together. It's kind of bound state. And that two helium atoms together is a boson overall, and that can form a boson condensate. So helium-3 can become a superfluid as well. So fermion by itself, as Ryan pointed out, should not form Bose-Einstein condensate. You can never have a macroscopic number of particles occupying a single quantum state because of Pauli exclusion principle. But when two fermions move together, they can, and that's indeed what happens for helium-3. And also for electrons in the solid, which become a superconductor uh, because when you have a super flow of electron, which is a charged object, that becomes a super electric current and the system becomes a superconductor. So that's the analogy we're going to use once we discuss this issue of the fermion first, then we extend the discussion to the condensate of those fermions in, in terms of their pairs called Cooper pairs. Okay, let me stop here and see if there are any questions. So the next, next lecture note you're supposed to look at before class is the fermions, the PDF, okay? Um, how does it make sense that <clears throat> two of the same operators anti-commute? Like how could we even distinguish what one operator is from the other if they're the same? Yeah, so that's something, it's very difficult to understand intuitively, I would say. So this is something you get used, you need to get used to. But you know, it's not crazy to talk about things that anti-commute. If you have two vectors in three-dimensional space, then when you talk about the cross product, A cross B, A cross B is the same as negative B cross A, right? Because the cross product is anti-symmetric. Mm -hmm. And somebody mentioned differential forms today, which you may, not everybody knows, but that's something that appears in differential geometry. And the differential forms also anti-commute. So it turns out that there are many examples in mathematics, like cross product of two vectors, the, uh, the, the wedge product of differential forms, where the product is change its sign when you change the objects inside the product. So having a product of two things that change sign uh, under the opposite ordering is not totally new to you. You have seen those in cross products. Now that the fact that these fields have these weird multiplication rules is new. And that's why it doesn't make sense immediately to you. In some sense, it never does to me either, but that's something we use as a tool. It turns out this is the only tool we can use to describe fermions in the language of quantum field theory. So at the end of the day, so we sort of accept mathematics of it. It may not make sense intuitively. It's not easy to imagine and understand, but that's the only way we can deal with it. Okay, yeah, All right. makes sense. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, um, so I'm just wondering, like if we wanted to write out the creation and annihilation operators like algebraically, like we can with the harmonic oscillator, mm -hmm. like even if they anti-commute as in fermions, would we still be able to do that? Yes, we can do that. I'm gonna show it actually. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? All right, this is John, and I see you on Friday. Thanks. Thank you. Actually, Professor. Yes, Henry. Uh, just like, oh yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I didn't, I didn't ask this so abruptly because like it, 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 I guess it doesn't really like, I guess it doesn't really like concern like exactly what we talked about, but like just like in general, like um, yeah, this is a more general thing. Like I, I guess like does um. 
it's like quant I guess like this quantization like like the, the, does that always occur when there's like special topological like uh, things going on because like for example like I noticed like um for example in something like the infinite square wall right like the like the first like potential that we learn in quantum mechanics it's like it's like I I I noticed that like the I noticed that like the wave function only like um only like I guess it only, it's only non-trivial on like a compact set. Mm -hmm. on like a compact interval mm -hmm. just like it, mm -hmm. it it vanished at the end point so it has compact mm -hmm. support as it, it vanished at the end points and it's like only non-trivial like uh in between so mm -hmm. like what is it like the, the, does like does like quantization always correspond to some like topological property like it's 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 like i i wouldn't say that for example there is a quantization of the energy atoms energy levels the hydrogen atom okay but it's not compact right this space is infinitely okay. extended and, and there's okay. nothing topological about this energy eigenvalues. Oh, okay. So that's not true. Yeah, so not every quantized okay. levels will correspond to something uh, with a topology. Okay, for sure, for sure. But that also, yeah, okay. that the fact that the energy of the hydrogen atom is not topological is basically the reason why excited states can easily decay. There's no real protection on that. Yeah, okay, for sure, for sure. Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. That's that's, that's all I want to ask. Yeah, yeah. Good. Uh, yeah. All right, for sure. All right, thank you so much. Okay. All right, take care. Bye.